Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So let's start with the next chapter revision and it's a very interesting chapter, although a bit lengthy, income under the head salary, but at the same time, very easy chapter. So I'll be doing it into two parts, a half of the salary I'll be covering today and remaining half I'll be covering in my next lecture, right? So let's understand what other things you should know. If you uh, want that I should be in a very comfortable position in the in this chapter, then these are the uh, contents which you should know about salary. First of all, you should understand what is employee and employer relationship because if there is a relationship of master and servant then only the income can be taxable under their salary and if this relationship is not there then we will not tax that income under their salary it will go in any other head right so i'll discuss about that also second an important thing you should understand how we tax salary we know that salary is taxable on due basis whatever the amount which gets due during the previous year that will become taxable and we also know that salary can be taxable on receipt basis also so we say like this that salary is taxable on due basis or receipt basis whichever is earlier receipt basis uh, by receipt basis you understand if you are getting advanced salary then also it is taxable i'll talk about that very important you should understand about components of salary what are various components of salary and how you will be dealing with them how much amount would be taxable how much is exempt from that component because we understand there are few components which are fully taxable like basic salary is always fully taxable dns allowance bonus commission commission of any type let it be a commission is fixed in percentage or it is fixed in amount any type of commission these are commission or fees are fully taxable and there are other components also, other allowances also, other perquisites also. So you should understand what are the base, uh, are the components of salary. So first we will deal with allowances. There are two kinds of allowances, official allowances and personal allowances. Official allowances are actually not, a, uh, not the income for the employee. Why? Because employee does not derive any benefit out of it. Official allowances are something which you receive because employer pays you because he would like to get the work done of office. You have to spend each and every uh, penny for office purpose. You are not taking anything to your home. So that is the reason official allowances are not taxable under any of the regime, whether you are following default tax regime or you are following optional tax regime. Official allowances are will be exempt. It will not be taxable. But yes, if employees saves anything from that official allowances. Let's say he is getting official allowances of 10,000 rupees per month. And out of that, that person spends 9,000 for office purpose and that person, that employee saves 1,000 out of it. In that case, whatever is the saving, that will become taxable. Otherwise, official allowances are fully exempt in both the tax regime. Second is of personal allowances. If Question is asking that you have to um, compute the salary income as per the default tax regime new scheme, then all personal allowances would be taxable. All personal allowances are taxable. HRA is taxable, children education allowance, hostel allowances, underground allowances, all personal allowances are taxable except one, transport allowance. Transport allowance would be exempt under both the tax regime and th there is the same treatment for that. If the employee is uh, physically handicapped or blind, deaf or dumb, in that case up to 3200 per month could be exempt for transport allowances under both the tax regime, same treatment. We will discuss that also. But if the assessee is following optional tax regime, old tax regime, if the question is asking you, please calculate as per optional tax regime, then in that case, there are few personal allowances which are exempt like hra hra is very important hra is exempt so we will see how much it is exempt second thing is the uh, your uh, children education allowances hostel allowances these are exempt we will see all personal allowances i have written only two because these two are important but we will be discussing all the allowances don't worry next part and very important in salary is perquisites and rent free accommodation is something which is one of the most important perquisites. So you should know how to compute 
this valuation of this perquisite of rent free accommodation if it is owned by the employer or it is hired by the employer remember you should know that second thing is motor car perquisite you should know interest free or concessional loan i'm just um, giving you these topics so that you can recall what was the treatment i'll be discussing everything today and also in next class sale of assets use of assets uh, sale of assets says that if employer has an asset and he's sold that asset to the employee at a very reasonable value or at concessional amount so employee might get benefit out of it let's say there was a computer uh, which employer has employer uh, has used that computer for a year or so after that they are just giving it to the employee they are uh, they are saying to the employee that if you want then you can buy this computer from us and you ha you have to pay just 2000 rupees for this computer so you have to calculate how much is the benefit to the employee so that benefit value that perquisite value you should calculate you should know that how to calculate these types of perquisite second thing is use of assets use of movable assets like uh, if they give they provide air condition at employees premises or any other furniture at employees premises that is they are not giving it permanently but they are giving it temporary temporary means till the time that employee is working with our organization we are we have given them that particular asset so that they can use it or their family member can use it so employee is deriving benefit out of it right because he got air conditioned or any other furniture at his place so how we will calculate that perquisite also that is a taxable perquisite and we should know how to treat that perquisite leave travel concession i'll tell you that if assessee is following new tax regime that is default then in that case ltc is fully taxable leave travel concession is fully taxable but if assessee is following uh, optional tax regime in that case ltc could be exempt up to certain limit we will discuss that medical facility is again important if medical facility is provided to the employee and how we will be computing the perquisite then next portion is retirement benefits retirement benefits like gratuity you should know how to compute gratuity if the person is a government employee how will it treat uh, the taxability of gra uh, gratuity portion and if the person is not a government employee if he is covered under gratuity act or not covered under, under gratuity act you should know the treatment pension leave salary is important vrs or retrenchment com compensation although not very important but you should know how you will deal with these um, points also provident fund important especially rpf recognized provident fund so you should know how to treat that recognized provident fund employer if employee is receiving a uh, contribution from employer in rpf or interest portion he is receiving then how we will compute that taxability of rpf statutory provident fund and urpf also sometimes examiner can ask you about urpf okay agni veer corpus fund it is an amendment also in agni veer corpus fund although not very difficult very easy portion uh, and there is a deduction also that i link that uh, particular point here with the chapter of deduction there is a deduction there there is a new section 80 cc h is introduced uh, by the recent uh, finance act 2023 so you should know about 80 cc h also and agnivir corpus fund i'll tell you and then finally you should know how to compute relief 89 if employee receives any arrears or advance salary and due to that their tax amount is increased they have to pay higher tax then they are eligible for relief also you should know how much relief we would be computing you should know the computation of that and last but not the least you should be very well versed with these things that what are the things which are taxable under default tax regime and what are the things which are not taxable or exempt under default and optional tax regime so examiner can ask you any of the regime so you should well prepared that what all things are there in default tax regime and what all things are taxable or exempt under optional tax regime okay so this was a uh, salary this we will be covering in uh, today's lecture and in next part so let's start with the portion of salary i believe you have this book now you can easily download this book from the website rachatmoga.com you can uh, it, the link is mentioned in the description also if you will go to the da download section you can easily download this book 
ओके फर्स्ट थिंग फर्स्ट चार्जिंग सेक्शन सेक्शन फिफ्टी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड दैट इफ एनी अमाउंट शुड बी चार्ज अंडर सैलरी सो देयर मस्ट बी द रिलेट द बिटवीन द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन द पेयर एंड द रिसीवर द पेयर द वन हु इज पेइंग शुड बी एम्प्लॉयर एंड द वन हु इज रिसीविंग शुड बी एन एम्प्लॉय राइट सो दिस रिलेशनशिप ऑफ मास्टर एंड सर्वेंट शुड बी देयर इफ यू वुड लाइक टू टेक्स दैट दैट इनकम अंडर दिस हेड अंडर दैट सैलरी इफ दिस रिलेशनशिप इज मिसिंग इन दैट केस this amount will not be taxed under this head it will be taxed um in some other head right so the relationship between the payer and pay must be employer and employee and even it could be ex employer also that is the reason when uh, let's say there was a, a government there is a government employee and he is retired long time back but still that person is receiving pension from Uh, that department for which he has worked earlier so it was their ex employer so in case your ex employer pays you amount like pension or any other uh, salary uh, kind of things then then again it will be taxed under the head salary so this employer could be your current employer also and this employer could also be your previous or your ex employer also correct but you know this point also that if employee dies let's say after the death of the employee still if the family members receives pension from the company from the organization so now the payer the person who is paying is employer but the person who is receiving is not exactly the employee it is their family members in that case the relationship of master and servant between the payer and the receiver is missing in that case that family pension will go under the head ifs income from other sources please don't uh, make it salary it will not be salary income it would be under the head ifs right that we will see in ifs chapter also okay second thing is we understand that salary income which we receive from our employer can be in the form of cash cash means more monetary form and it could be in the form of kind that is specific, specifically perquisites perquisites when perquisites are provided generally they are there are monetary perquisites also but mostly they are non monetary like accommodation perquisite is provided motor car facility is provided any other or domestic servant is provided so these all are non monetary things also so salary in salary we see that whatever we are receiving from our employer because of employment contract because of employment contract that whether it was it is monetary or or it is non monetary also in that case it would be taxed under the head salary see i have used the word there should be a uh, um, employment contract because sometimes it might happen that employee is providing some services and these services are outside the scope of employment contract this is something which he is providing extra and in that case for providing these services the employer is paying that person an amount so that amount will not be taxed under the head salary why because this is not as per the employment contract let's say i give you an example uh, the same example i have given in the uh, hindi and english lecture also this the second lecture which i record um let's say there is an employee and he is a finance manager he is a let's say he is a chartered accountant and he is working with nestle limited nestle limited is the employer and this person is a chartered accountant he is working as a finance manager he is an employee so he is getting x amount per month as salary so that amount is salary but at the same time this particular person the employee who is a chartered accountant at the same time he is a good chef and this is uh, and he is quite famous he is quite famous he has his youtube channel and he is quite famous and his employer also knows about this an employer his boss tells him that we have a party we have a office party why don't you uh, act like a chef please uh, uh, in that in party in that particular function you will arrange everything you will arrange everything you can uh, bring your team or will help you you would be a uh, uh, be like a chief chef you will be the main chef over there okay so in that case he says okay boss i'll do that thing 
and for that the company is paying nestle is paying let's say 50000 rupees to him okay so this 50000 rupees which he is getting is it because of employment contract the answer is no he is a finance manager he is a he has a finance background right that 50000 rupees he is getting which is something which is outside of the employment contract so this amount which he got has received you cannot say although the payer is employer and the receiver is employee but the amount which this is this the amount which he is getting is not because of their employment contract so in that case it will go in either pgbp or ifos that we will see but practically this is something which is uh, practically you have to see in your exam they will not not ask but you should know that the amount which you are receiving is should be as per your employment contract right okay so example of salary is we all understand basic salary it could be bs basic salary allowances perquisites retirement benefits even sweat equity shares which we received we, i'll tell you how we will compute uh, that uh, this treatment of sweat equity shares and all pension from previous employer also if you are receiving that would be under this head salary gratuity leave salary or any other benefit which you receive at the time of retirement this is also all salary income as i have already mentioned that there must be a relationship of master and servant we also know that partners receive salary i'm using the word salary partners receive salary from their partnership firm but tell me is the relationship between the partnership firm and the partners is it of master and servant the answer is no partners are the owners right partners are the owners they are not servant right so if when partners receive salary from their own partnership firm that cannot be taxed under the head salary we will see that is taxed under the head pgbp that we will cover in pgbp lecture okay second thing is uh, there are member of parliament or member of legislative assemblies mps or mlas uh, they are not government employee they are not government employee right they are just elected members they are not government employee but they receive salary also from government but is the government their employer the answer is no government is not their employer so in that case when mp or mla receives any salary from government that will be taxed under ifos it will not be covered under salary correct okay do you understand this phrase contract of service and contract for service contract of service means that you are working somewhere as an employee so in that case uh, you uh, you and your employee employer has entered into a contract you sign that i um, am accepting this offer that is contract of service that is job right so if there is a contract of service then it is salary but if it is contract for services see contract for services contract for services means that you have your own office let's say you are a practicing chartered accountant you are a practicing chartered accountant and if some companies uh, some company approaches you uh, that company approach you and they say that we would like to get some consultancy or we would like to get our accounts audited statutory audit tax audit anything right so uh, you can accept that or you can deny also right right so this is what this is uh, are you becoming an employee of that company the answer is no this is a very this is a transaction that is principled on the basis of principle to principle that is not on principle to servant right so here you are a practicing chartered accountant it's your profession to render services to your clients so when you are rendering your services to your clients so that is not that amount which you, re you are receiving from your clients your customers that will not be taxed under the head salary that would be pgbp so contract for services where any service provider a practicing ca or practicing cost accountant or a practicing lawyer so these all things are on principle to principle basis that is contract for service right although contract of service contract for service not very important for examination but you should know okay one more foregoing of salary and surrender of salary forgo forgo means you are not taking salary but you are diverting your salary income to someone else you are diverting you are saying to your employer you have said to your employer that don't give salary to me give the salary to my mother so you forgo the salary you are just diverting that salary to your mother 
so will you still be taxable will income tax act will say income tax officer will say uh, this is your salary the answer is yes if you even divert your salary to someone else then it doesn't mean that you will be discharged from your obligation no it will be uh, it is due in your hands and you have to give tax on it also sir i have not received sir my mother has received so my mother will pay income no you are just diverting your income that is forgo or if he, even if you you can say don't give it to your ma, uh, my mother give it to my brother or even to give it to my padosi give padosi means neighbor so give it to my neighbor or give it to any orphanage let's say if you are saying that but you are giving directions to your employer when you give direction to your employer don't give it to me give it to someone else and who you tell also please give it to my mother give it to my brother give it to my neighbor give it to that orphanage in that case that is called forgo of salary forgo of salary it it is irrelevant you will be taxed the employee will be taxed it will become income of the employee right second thing is surrender of salary surrender of salary is like you are acting like a monk i don't want salary sir i will work free for you i will work free for you whatever salary you have to give it to me don't give it to me employer will say then whom should i give this salary you say i don't know i don't know uh, you have to manage it yourself you are saying to your employer you have you can manage that money i don't know whatever you would like to wherever you would like to give that money i am not saying anything but i will not take salary that is called surrender of salary so when you are acting like a monk right you don't want salary you will work for free rarely it can happen right but if this is the case surrender of salary so surrender of salary is not taxable surrender of salary is not taxable because now the salary is not getting due in your hands in the first case the salary was getting due but you were diverting it to someone else and you are indicating also that is forgo forgo is taxable but if it is surrender please don't tax it right easy okay next is computation of salary important and easy again first of all i always tell my students that whenever you are uh, you will get this question of salary in your exams or anywhere any time when you are practicing also please make a list of all the things which you are getting which everything which is mentioned in the question please make a list of so let's say in your examination you get a salary question and it is mentioned over there that employee is getting basic salary employee is getting da that person is getting house rent allowance that person is getting any other allowance like overtime lunch allowance medical allowance anything that person is getting per qz so and so so many things are mentioned over there just go and simply first make a list of it just make a list of it don't worry about the taxability you have to first you have to make a list of it so if you are getting basic salary da bonus might be it might be taxable it might be exempt it might be partially exempt also but please your first step should be please go and make a list go and make a list go and make a list first is sal basic salary da bonus commission everything then after once you have covered everything which is mentioned in your question then comes to that particular portion whether it is taxable or it is exempt if it is taxable then write it over here if it is exempt then write exempt or if it is partially taxable partially exempt so whatever amount is taxable right here whatever amount is taxable right here and also mention if you are exempted then you can mention it by way of note or simply you can mention it over here i would suggest because uh, in your examination you have a very limited time guys you have a very limited time and uh, if you will keep on making if you are keep on decorating if you will spend time in decorating your question and unnecessarily you will make so many notes then you will get very you will be uh, i don't think that you will be left with time in that case so please we have to be, be smart if a note is something which is very important for the question then please go and make some notes note 1 2 or 3 maximum 2 or 3 otherwise if it is uh, you just have to explain through that note and it you have to explain in just one or two line so it is very much recommended that please don't make a separate note just simply mention over there why you are exempting it or why you are making it tax right you are taxing that income so whatever first you have to your first step should be first step should be write all the things 
uh, one by one everything which is mentioned in the question make a list and then whatever is the taxable amount write it over here please remember there are few components which are fully taxable always fully taxable one is basic salary always fully taxable second is dearness allowance dearness allowance is always taxable whether that dearness allowance is a part of retirement benefit or not part of retirement benefit is something which we um, that portion will come into picture only when we have to compute like hra or rent free accommodation or provident fund uh, taxability that portion will come into picture while calculating those amount right otherwise if dns allowance is mentioned you have to compute you have to make the entire da taxable please make the entire da taxable so if it is mentioned that 60 percent forming part of retirement benefits please forget about it right now whatever da please make it taxable so when you will be take, um, cal calculating your hra or your uh, uh, your recognized provident fund or other types of perquisite in that case you will be uh, needing that how much amount is uh, performing part of retirement benefit but otherwise da is fully taxable bonus is always fully taxable bonus is fully, fully taxable commission any type of commission let it be on percentage basis let it be on fixed let it be fixed amount in the uh, form of fixed commission fixed amount any type of commission whether it is on the basis of percentage of turnover with whether it is on the basis of percentage of purchase or anything please commission is always commission or fees is always fully taxable yes when we calculate uh, our hra exemption or your uh, rpf etc exemption then we consider only that commission that is on the basis of fixed percentage commission on turnover but that is for the calculation of hra and everything right not here here whenever whatever commission which you have received please make it fully taxable right then other taxable allowances only taxable portion you have to mention for accused taxable portion so these are the basic components we are, we are discussing it one by one right so once you calculate your gross salary once you have calculated your gross salary after gross salary there is a deduction available there is a deduction av available you understand that is section 16 deduction there are three deductions in section 16 one is standard deduction and standard deduction is available in both the tax regime whether you are following default tax regime standard deduction would be av available same gross salary or 50,000 whichever is lower or you are following optional tax regime standard reduction will be available in new tax regime in default tax regime only standard reduction is available no other deduction because we have other deductions also two more deductions entertainment allowance reduction and tax on employment but these two deductions are available only under optional tax regime if assessee is following default tax regime 115 bac or i can say new tax regime only give one deduction only give one deduction. If they are following optional tax regime, you can give all three deductions if they are there. Okay. So I have already discussed basic salary, DA, bonus, commission is always fully taxable. Whenever you see this, please make it fully taxable. Commission, any type of commission, fully taxable. Right? Basic salary, you understand basic salary is fully taxable. Um, Examiner will not ask you, please define what is basic salary. No, they will not ask you, but you should know basic salary is fully taxable. But one thing which you should know, sometimes basic salary is given on grade pay basis. Like you have seen 15,000, let's say, this is for example, 15,000 dash 500 dash 17,000 dash 1,000 dash 20,000. So do you remember how you will uh, calculate this basic salary? Let me discuss this with you. So let's say it is mentioned in your question that employee is getting on the basis of grade pay so this is grade pay so let's say it is mentioned in the question that uh, his grade pay is whenever he joins his grade pay is 15000 dash 500 dash 17000 dash let's say 1000 dash 20000 so how you will compute this basic salary so it means whenever the employee joins this organization, whenever the employee joins this company or organization, he will be getting basic salary of 15,000 per month. He will be getting his basic salary would be 15,000 per month. So his basic salary, his or her basic salary will be 
15,000 per month. And this will start from his joining date, from his joining. Whenever he is joining, let it, uh, let it be that it could he uh, um, that person has joined on 1st April. That person can also join on any other date, let's say 1st May or 15th June, whenever. But from his joining date, from that person's joining date till next 12 months, that is one year. The first one year, he will be getting basic salary of 15,000 per month. Each month, he will be getting 15,000, 15,000, 15,000 and so on. Once he completed his first year, once he complete, once the employee completes his first year, after that, there will be an increment in the basic salary. How much will be the increment? 500. 500 will be the increment after one year of completion of his service. So the next increment would be 500. So in that case, this person will be getting. So after 12 months, the basic salary will become 15,500. And for next 12 months, that is still second year. In the second year, he will for every month, he will be receiving 15,500. Once this 12 months is over, once the second year is over, in the third year, he will be getting again an increment of 500. It will become 16,000. And for next 12 months, it will remain 16,000 per month, 16,000 per month, 16,000 per month and so on. After that, again, 500 increment, it will become 16,500 and so on for next 12 months. After that, it will become 17,000, again, 500 increment. But once 17,000 is there for 12 months, he will be receiving 17,000, 17,000, 17,000 per month each for entire 12 months. After that, the next increment would be 1,000. It would be 18,000 for next 12 months. After that, 19,000 because now the increment is annual increment is 1,000 each. 19,000 for next 12 months. After that, 20,000 for next 12 months. And once 20,000 is given for 12 months, after that, he will be shifted to another grade, right? This is how grade pay works. Sometimes it happens that in your exam, uh, nation, examiner can ask you. Because some practically sometimes it happens because uh, if the employee is quite qualified or uh, he is quite skillful, he is experienced, then in that case, we will not start from 15,000. Let's say it, if it is mentioned in the question that employee has uh, given three increments or four increments when, when, uh, whenever he has joined, his, joined the company, he has been provided, let's say one increment. One increment means 500 increment has already been provided. So in that case, his joining would be from 15,500. Because in that case, he will not start from 15,000. He has it start from after one increment. So one increment is 500. So 15,500. He will start it from 15,500. Right? Remember that. Okay. So this was important. Great pay. Next is. DNS allowance. DNS allowance, I have already told you, DNS allowance is fully taxable. If it is mentioned in the question that 60%, 70%, 80% forms part of retirement benefits, please, uh, it is irrelevant as of now because DA is fully taxable. Whenever you will be computing your gross salary, please DA make it fully taxable. How much form, forms part 60, 70, 80% is irrelevant as of now. Please, you should tax entire DA. DA is fully taxable. That is only relevant. How much percentage forms part of return benefit? That is only relevant while calculating uh, those values like HRA, RPF, etc. Because that is required there. Because in their computation, we require only that DA which forms part of return benefit. So that is not relevant here. Here, whenever you are writing DA, please tax entire DA. How much is forming part of return benefit? You should not be bothered about that as of now. You will only be uh, taking that into picture. You will only consider that whenever you will be uh, computing your HRA or other benefits, right? Where you require only that DA which forms part of the retirement benefit, right? Okay. Bonus, I have already mentioned it is fully taxable. Bonus is fully taxable. Fees and commission is fully taxable. Whether it is on the basis of percentage of turnover, percentage of purchase, let's say it is fixed in percentage or fixed in amount, whatever type of commission is there, please make it fully taxable. Only in that case, let's say because in HRA computation, we take only that commission which is 
or fixed percentage commission on turnover, it is relevant there while computing that HRA, not here, right? Okay. One more point you should know what is advanced difference between advanced salary and advanced again salary. Easy. Advanced salary is what? Advanced salary is when you take salary in advance. When you take a salary in advance, let's say you have already you have already received 12 months salary, which is of this year, but you need some more money. You need some more money. There is some function or there is any other emergency is there um, and you need some more money. So you ask your employer, can you give me one month salary in advance or two months salary in advance? So if employer accepts it, you will receive that amount. So that is advanced salary and that becomes your income. And because it doesn't get due because that is related to let's say next year, but you have received it. So we understand we have already discussed that salary is taxable on due or received basis, whichever is earlier. Correct. So uh, if you receive advanced salary, this is your income. Right, because you're not, not going to pay it back because this is the advanced salary which you have received it. Right? Next month you will not get that amount because you have already received an advance. If you have received an advance, it will be taxable. This, this, this is your income. But if you receive advance against salary, this is loan, this is not income. This is something which you have to repay back to the employer. So why advance against salary is written over there? It means that because you are an employee, you, are work, you work over there, you receive salary. That is the reason you are uh, you went to your employer and you say, boss, I need some money. I need some money. I'll repay it back. You can deduct so much, so and so amount every month from my salary, but I'll repay it back. So advance against salary is not income. It is a loan. It's a liability which you will be repaying it back, right? So advance again salary is known, advance salary is income. Advance salary is taxable in the year in which you have received it. Although it doesn't get, get due, but you have received it because we understand salary uh, is taxed on due or received basis, whichever is earlier, right? So if advance salary got taxed this year, although it was related to next year, so next year also you will be make it taxable on due basis? No, if it was already taxed, in the previous year, then you will not be text, texting it again, right? Second thing is advance again salary. Please don't make it taxable. This is simply a loan. But yes, we will cover this thing in our perquisite. If you have received loan from your employer and the interest rate which employer has charged is less than the bank rate, than the usual bank rate of SBI, then in that case, now you are getting a benefit. And which benefit you are getting it? That is interest free loan or concessional interest loan. So that is another thing. The loan amount, let's say you have received 1 lakh rupees as loan, 1 lakh will not be your income. This is just a loan. But you have received it interest free, let's say. And normally the interest was, let's say in your uh, question it is written that the normal bank rate, SBA rate of interest is, let's say 10%. And you have received it at 0%. So how much you are saving every year? Let's say it was for entire year. Let's say the outstanding balance is for entire year. So one lakh is not a loan, is a loan. It is not an income, but the interest which you save, the interest which you save will become a perquisite that we will see in the our perquisite. So in that case, the example, which I have, I was just discussing in that case, normal SBI rate is 10%. So let's say it is for entire year. 10% means 10,000 rupees the interest which you have to pay if you would have taken it from SBI or neither bank you have to pay 10,000 but here your employer has given you interest free so they are not charging any interest zero so how much is your perquisite 10,000 so 10,000 will become your income in that case that we will see in perquisite but in perquisite that is what that is interest free or concessional interest loan uh, amount that that will become perquisite but the loan amount the principal amount which you are taking which because you will be giving it back to the employer that is not your income right and salary due date this is quite important salary due date because you understand sometimes you see that salary generally if nothing is mentioned in the question then we will always presume that salary gets due on the last day of the month salary gets due on the last day of the month right but if it is specifically mentioned that salary gets due, let's say in the next month, let's say first day of next month or second day of next month, then you have to consider that particular uh, instructions as per the question. But 
If the question is silent, please always assume that salary gets due on the last day of the month. What does this mean? Let me explain this. See, our previous year for 2024 examination is previous year 23-24, right? This means what is the start date of this previous year? The start date is 1st April 2023 till 31st March 2024. So these are the, this is the year, this is the previous year for our examination. So when I say that salary is taxable on due basis, it means that if your salary is getting due during this period, during this entire period of one year, starting from 1st April 2023, inclusive, include this date, during this period and this date, 31st March 2024, include, include this date also, inclusive. So whenever I say that salary gets, salary is taxable on due basis, it means that anything which gets due during this period will be taxable in this previous year, right? So. Let's say this is, I'm taking uh, a month, April, April 2023, another month, May 23, and so on. Let's say till uh, February 2024, March 2024. If the question is silent, please always assume that your salary is getting due on the last day of the month, of the same month, last day of the same month. So please tell me if the salary I'm referring to is of April 2023, it should get due on the last day of April. Last day of April means 30th of April. Last day is 30th April 2023. May salary next month. May 23 salary will get due on last day of the month. Last day is 31st May 2023. Okay, and so on. February 24, what is the last day? 24 is a leap year. So February is uh, 29th. It would be 29th. 29th February 2024 is the last day. This is the day on which fe uh, February salary will get due. March salary will get due on. 31st March 2024, right? Tell me whether this date, 30th April, April salary date, April is April salary date, April 2023 salary date is 30th April. Please tell me whether this date is part of this period or not. Answer is yes. 30th April is a part of this year. It's, this means thus that April salary is getting due in this year, in our period. So we will text this, we will text April salary. Similarly, May salary, 31st May 23, of course it is a part of 31st May 23 falls in this period. So we can say, yes, May salary will also be taxable in this year. February, 29th February 2024, tell me whether this date belongs to this period. Answer is yes, it is. Then February salary will also be taxed in this year. March 24 salary, it is getting due on 31st March 24, getting it? Is this 31st March 24 part of this period? Very much, yes, 31st March 2024. This is, I have said this, date will also be included. So this uh, salary will also be taxed in this particular period. Now tell me, let me, this was April 23, let me uh, go uh, one more month prior to this, that would be May, sorry, March 23. Salary gets due on the last day of the same month, last day of the same month. So March 23 is the, sal uh, is the salary month and the last day of this month would be 31st March 23, 31st March 23. Tell me whether this date 
is part of this period? The answer is no. This period is starting from 1st April 23 and I'm talking about 31st March 23 is not part of this period. So you cannot tax March 23 salary in this year. March 23 salary would be taxable in previous year 22, 23 last year, right? Because this date on which it is getting due is not a part of our year, correct? So you will not tax this, you will not consider this period. You will consider from April 23 onwards. Similarly, tell me, this was March 24, right? After March, it would be April 24, okay? April 24. And when I say that salary gets due on the last day of the month, last day of the month is April 24. Last day of the month would be 30th April 24. It will be 30th of April 24. Is this date, this date is the due date of April salary, right? This is the due date for April salary. Is this date part of my period? The answer is no. So this is 30th April 24, our period is ending on 31st March. So this means this April salary cannot be taxed here on due basis because it is not getting due. That is another point that if I receive this salary in advance, that is another point, then it will become taxable. But right now I'm just discussing about due basis, right? So on due basis, if you ask me that then April, I'll not take March 23, but yes, from April 23, I'll take April, May, June, July, and so on till February, March. March I can take, but April I'll not take. So if the salary gets due on the last of the month, then it is very simple. You will take only from April 2023, that is from the here till here, till March 2024, right? April to March 2024, 12 months period. That's it, simple. Right. On the other hand, if question specifically says that salary gets due, let's say on the first day of next month, repeat with me, first day of next month, right? If salary gets due on the first day of next month, then how you will go about it? Okay, let me erase this first. This is for sure, our previous year is 23-24 for our 2024 examinations. Start from 1st April 23 till 31st March 2024 and we now know that anything which gets due during this period would be taxable, right, in this year on due basis. And now I am saying that salary gets due, salary gets due on let's say first day of next month let me write it neatly okay first day of next month what does this mean so if this month is let's say uh january this is january 2024 then it gets due on the first day of next month that is first february okay let me start from very beginning. Uh, let me start from April 2023. Tell me, if I am saying that salary gets due on the first day of next month, so tell me April 23 salary will get due on which date? So next month first. So next month is May 23. First day, yeah, this, this means first May 2023. Okay. So April salary will get due on first May 23. First May 23 is falling in this period. The answer is yes. That means April 23 will be taxed in this particular period. Okay. Let me go a month back. March 23. Tell me if the salary which is related to March 23. On which date it will get due? Please remember this salary gets due on the first day of next month. So it will get due on 1st April 23, right? Next month, 1st April. Please tell me 1st April, 1st April 23. Is this date is falling in my period or not? 
answer is yes sir first day it is first april 23 this is falling in this period it means that march 23 will march 23 salary will also be taxed in this period okay let me go okay let me shift it a bit let me go a month previous prior to this february 23 tell me february 23 when will february 23 a uh, salary will get due if i am saying that it gets due on first day of next month february next month is march so that is first march 23 is the date when it will get due tell me if first march 23 is part of my period the answer is no this first march is not the a date which is uh, which belongs to my period it means that february salary will not be taxed over here february salary will not be taxed over here because it gets due on first march 23 so it will be uh taxed in last year that is previous year 22 23 but not in this period so you cannot text this okay so you will start from march 23 okay let me go till february 24 february 24 salary will get due on when first day of next month first march 24 okay first march 24 does this date belongs to my period the answer is yes sir first march 24 our period will end on 31st march 24 this date belongs to our period so this means that february 24 will also be well, coming in our taxable dates right and next is march 24 march 24 when will march 24 salary will get due sir march period belongs to our date no no tell me the date on which it gets due sir it gets due on the first day of next month so this is first april 24 first april 24 next month first day first april 24 does this date this date on which it is getting due is this date forms part of our period the answer is no it doesn't so this march 24 will not come under our period right so we will take only we will take only from march 23 till february 24 so march 23 till february 24 again a period of 12 months but now it is from starting from march and ending till february last it was in earlier example it was from april to march but here it is from march to february you don't have to learn it but you should remember that when it is getting due so if it is getting due in our period then you can make it taxable right so march 24 will not be taxed over here because it will get due on first april and i'm assuming that you have not received a uh, march salary also in this period because if you have received it then it was taxed it will be taxed on reset basis but right now i'm just uh explaining about the due basis so due basis means the uh, if the salary is getting if nothing is mentioned in the question although um 90% of the cases you will not find anything like this it will not be mentioned so you'll always assume that salary gets due in the same month itself last day of the month otherwise if it is uh specifically mentioned in the question that salary gets due in the next month then you have to do it accordingly right so this was a bit important okay not so important but it was a bit complex that that is the reason i have explained it to you next part is allowances you have to give me a minute guys just give me a minute okay guys let's come to allowances as i've already mentioned allowances are of two types one is official allowance second is personal allowances first let's uh, discuss about the official ones See, official allowances are something uh, by which employee is not getting any benefit. They are not deriving any benefit out of official allowances. Why? Because that is for official purpose. Employer is providing these allowances so that you can meet your official, your duty expenses, right? So if you are deriving any benefit out of it, if you are saving, if you are saving something out of, out of the official allowances, then it becomes taxable. Otherwise, it is exempt under both the tax regimes so official allowances are exempt either you are following default tax regime or you are following your optional tax regime some of the examples of official allowances are traveling allowance daily allowance conveyance allowance 
these are some of the official allowances do you know what is traveling and what is the difference between a traveling allowance and a conveyance allowance let's say if uh, you are um, you have an office in bangalore bangalore in fact you have an office in bangalore and uh, if your employer is sending you for five or seven days to chennai you have a project in chennai you have to go to the client's place and then you will come back after five seven days so there would be some expenses which which will be incurred by you right or your employer has to incur it is employer's responsibility that he should send you to uh, from bangalore to chennai so if they are giving you allowances to travel outside the city for official purpose that is called your traveling allowance on the other hand conveyance allowances again for official purpose both are official but conveyance allowance is when you travel within the city let's say there are some places in bangalore let's say you have your office uh, in banshankri or you have to travel to jayanagar so these are different places i have been to bangalore uh, not many times once or twice so there are some places in bangalore uh, so if you are traveling from banshankri to, to jayanagar in bangalore that is for official purpose in that case that is a conveyance allowance so it is again an official allowances and it would be exempt but yes if there is any saving from that allowance that will become taxable daily allowance let's say if you have been uh, to chennai from bangalore you are going to chennai for 7 8 days so there would be some expenses like your daily allowance uh, daily expenses like uh, your hotel bills or your lodging expenses or your food expenses which is your employer's obligation because he has sent uh, you to uh, another city so that is again a daily allowances so daily allowances are exempt unless and until there is a saving similarly we have helper allowances helper allowance helper is a person who this is not servant allowance servant allowance is personal servant means uh, domestic help right that is a pers uh, personal allowance that is fully taxable but this is helper allowance helper allowance is uh, specifically in a uh, uh, marketing domain let's say there is an employee who is working as a marketing executive he has to carry some appliances and he has to give demonstration to the uh, client's place he has to visit to the client's place and they have, they have to give demonstration and sometimes these appliances are so big that that employee cannot carry those uh, appliances on his motorcycle or motorbike for that he needs one more assistance he needs one more helper so it is employer's duty to get a helper arranged for him so that uh, that helper can hold that particular appliances and he will sit back and he will also help in giving demonstration of that appliances to the clients or customers so in that case let's say if employer does not arrange a helper for you but employer says to you that please arrange a helper for yourself and how much helper will take he will take 6000 or 7000 per month and we will give it to you so uh, let's say that helper is taking 7000 per month and the 7000 per month employer is giving to us as a helper allowance so whatever the amount which we are getting from our company we are spending it on helper so that is a official allowance so nothing would be taxable but yes if there is any saving let's say you are getting 7000 rupees from the company and you are paying only 6000 to the helper that is one month 1000 per month you are saving every month that will be your taxable right helper allowances and official allowances if nothing is mentioned please consider that everything is spent on official purpose academic allowance or research allowances what are research allowances let's say if there is a pharmaceutical company uh, and they are uh, there are some scientists their employees they are working as scientists and they are working on any project any new medicine for that they need uh, raw material they need chemicals and everything so employer what will employer give they uh, used to give them money per month so that they can buy those chemicals or those, those raw materials and all so this, this is again for official purpose similarly academic allowance let's say they would like to buy some books or any academic material so that is again for official duties uniform allowances some companies have culture even we see that most of the manufacturing units manufacturing fact these factories they want their uh, workers to come in a particular uniform so for that employer provides them with uniform let's say employer is not providing with them uniform but they are paying every month or every six months they are paying uniform allowance to them so that they can purchase uniform that is again for official purpose 
fully exempt unless and until there is saving. So these type of expenses which are official in nature where, where employee is not deriving any benefit of out of it. So that is fully exempt either you are following any of the scheme. Right. On the other hand, personal allowances are something which are for the benefit of the employee. Employee can take these money. Allowances are something. Uh, allowances is what? It is in the form of money. You get these amount with your salary. Right. So if they are giving you personal allowances, this would be fully taxable if you are following all types of personal allowances are fully taxable if you are following default tax regime. In new tax regime, in 115 BSE, all personal allowances are fully taxable except one, transport allowances from a home to office and back. That is exempt in both the scheme and the same treatment is there. 3200 per month is except for the employees who are suffering with the physical disabilities, including blindness, deaf or dumb. Then in that case, 3200 per month is exempt in both the regimes. Otherwise, if you are following default tax regime, all personal allowances are would be taxable. In optional tax regime, although most of the personal allowances are taxable, but there are few personal allowances like HRA, like children education allowance, hostel allowances, outstation allowances. These are ex exempt up to certain except, uh, limit, right? So. If you are following a new tax regime, please tax entire HRA. HRA is not exempt in new tax regime. In default tax regime, it is not exempt. In optional, it is exempt up to a limit. We know that there are three limits. Actual HRA received rent paid minus 10% of salary or 40 or 50% of salary. 40, 50, why we follow 50? 50 in that case, if uh, the employee is paying rent in any of the four metros, that is Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata or Chennai, in that case, it would be 50. So we will see about these HRA, children, education allowance, hospital allowances, transport allowances, same treatment in both the regimes. If uh, employee is not suffering from any physical disability or that person is not blind, deaf and dumb, normal employee, in that case, fully taxable under both the tax regime. But if person is physically handicapped, blind, deaf or dumb, in that case, 3200 per month will be exempt. Outstation allowance, underground allowances, fully taxable in default, but yes, to certain extent, exempt under optional tax regime. First of all, let's understand house rent allowance. Default tax regime, fully taxable, no problem at all. In optional tax regime, you can exempt up to certain limit. That is exempt under section 1013A. No, no need to remember this section number, but you should know it is exempt up to certain limit. How much it is exempt? HRA is exempt up to these lower least of the following. First is actual HRA received. Second is rent paid minus 10% of salary. Here salary, we will take only basic salary. DA forming part. If question is silent about how much a DA forms part of retirement benefit, if it is not mentioned in the question, please don't take DA in this particular calculation of RBS. RBS is rate retirement. I have given it a name, RBS, that is retirement benefit salary. So retirement benefit salary is a... Uh, why I have given this name because it this definition of salary, which is basic salary, DA forming part, fixed percentage commission on tur turnover, it is used in many places. Like here, we will use it HRA in gratuity, we will use it in recognized provident fund, you use it. Okay, we, we use this amount, with the, we use this phrase RBS, this particular definition at many places. That is the reason I have given it a name RBS, that is called retirement benefit salary. So how much you will exempt least of the following actual HRA second is rent paid minus 10% of salary which salary RBS salary and 40% of salary. But if the employee is paying rent in uh, the city like Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata or Chennai in that case 50% don't take 40% then then take 50% but in any of the city let's say Bangalore or uh, in Gurgaon anywhere then take least 40% right. Important point, whenever you will, you will be computing the exemptions of HRA, whenever you will be computing the uh, exemption of HRA, you will be computing your salary that is RBS, basic salary, DA forming part. Please take only that salary which pertains to that period for which you are computing HRA. Let's say you have received HRA for six months. Please take this 
salary only for those six months only for those six months right if you are have received hra for 12 months please take salary of only 12 months let's say it is mentioned in the question that you have received some salary in advance that advance salary we understand that if that would be taxed that that would be taxable separately but while computing this limit while computing this this limit please don't take that advance salary or areas of salary into consideration while com computing this rps salary for the number of months you have received hra please compute please take the, all the components of this salary of this rent of this rbs of that particular period only please don't take any advance salary or any areas of salary while computing our uh, hra exemption correct so any areas or advance should not be computed and if the employee is not paying rent let's say employee is not paying rent in that case we understand second uh, limit is rent paid minus 10 percent of salary so if rent paid is zero if the rent paid is zero zero minus 10 percent of salary would be a negative amount technically but exemption cannot be negative right so we'll say zero so if we if employee is not paying rent so this limit would be zero anyways the least of the three would be zero so in that case there would be no exemption at all because these of the following would be zero that means zero exemption so uh, it can come in mcq especially if the person is following default tax regime so anyways there is no exemption right fully hra is fully taxable but if the uh, employees fo uh, following optional tax regime and if there is an mcq they will give you so many points that uh, employees getting this, employees paying rent, so and so, he is residing here, here. And if the question mentions that there is no rent paid, rent paid is zero, in that case, please don't waste your time in calculating those exemptions because you understand if there is no rent paid, if the, there is no rent paid in that case, then this limit would be zero and least of the following would be zero. Right. So if the employee is not paying rent, there would be no exemption allowed. And this is very important. Third point is very important because it happens. It might happen. That your HRA might changed in between you. I think you must have done these uh, such type of questions that your HRA will change in between or your rent paid will change in between or your retirement benefit salary, any of the component like basic salary, DA or any fixed percentage of commission on turnover changes in between. So whenever there is any change whenever there is any change which is related to hra calculations or in any of the component hra gets changed rent paid gets changed place of paying rent let's say uh, uh, previously the employee is residing in a non metro now he is uh, that person is res residing in delhi mumbai kolkata or chennai in that case if there is any change please split your hra exemption into that particular period right let's say if there is a change after six months then please calculate prep, uh, six months period separately next six months period separately let's say if there is there are two changes one after four months another after five months right so please calculate your exemption period separately i i believe that you remember this so whenever there is change please compute your hra exemption separately right Okay, when I'll take uh, some classes related to your, um, when I'll be discussing some uh, practical questions, then I'll cover that uh, particular question also with you, if you have not done it yet. But I believe in your regular lectures, you must have done that. If you have taken it from me, of course, then you, have, you would have done that. And if even if you have taken it from any other faculty, I believe that you have done such type of questions also when there is a change in HRA, right? Okay. Next is children education allowance. See, if the assessee is following default tax regime, entire children education allowances would be taxable. Entire children education allowance or hostel allowances would be taxable. But if the assessee is following optional tax regime, that is old tax regime, then children education allowances is exempt up to 100 rupees per month per child. And maximum up to two children 100 rupees per month per child maximum up to two children let's say if your question says that um, there are two children and for that employee is getting 120 rupees per month 
for each child 120 120 120 for first 120 for second then of course for first exempt out of 120 exempt 100 20 would be taxable second out of uh, second for second one we are receiving 120 exempt 100 again 20 would be taxable so every month 40 rupees would be taxable 40 into 12 you can calculate it 480 but let's say sometimes examiner might confuse you examiner will say that uh, there is an employee he receives children education allowances for three children okay he receives children education allowance for three children and that to rupees 240 it is not per child he will say that 240 per month for all three children is a saving so some students will do okay sir for one child, child we can exempt up to 100 second child we can exempt again 100 that is 200 so some people some students will do sir we will exempt 200 out of it only 40 would be taxable per month and let's say it is for 12 months 40 into 12 480 would be taxable right that is wrong what you have to do is if this is 240 first of all please analyze whether it is for each child or for all the children so it is for all three children 240 is for all three children just segregate for each child how much it will be that would be 240 divided by 3 it would be 80 rupees for each child so for first child second child and third child we have received 80 for first 80 for second 80 for third understand i have done 240 divided by 3. 80 rupees for each children child and we know that it can be exempt up to rupees 100 and for any two ch children for any two children so for first child we can exempt up to 100 but now we are receiving just 80 so maximum we can exempt only till 100 right but here we are just receiving 80 so maximum exemption would be 80 in that case for first we will exempt 80 taxability would be how much would be taxable zero okay for first child zero second child it can go up to 100 but right now we are just receiving 80 so 80 would be exempt again zero taxable and for third child how much we can exempt no we will not exempt anything from third child because this exemption can only be up to for two children so for this one everything would be taxable 80 rupees would be taxable so how much is taxable per month zero plus zero plus 80 that is 80 rupees per month would be taxable let's say into 12 that will make 960 rupees so 960 would be taxable right so earlier we were com computing 40 into 12 that was wrong that was wrong so whenever if examiner will try to confuse you please don't get confused so if it is for 240 rupees per month for each child then for each child it is 240 240 240 but if they are mentioning that it is just for 240 per month for all three children so please analyze it that for every child how much it will be right same uh, concept will go for hostel allowances also under default tax regime entire hostel allowance would be taxable or children education because there is no exemption in default tax regime but if the assessee is following optional tax regime in that case uh for children education 100 rupees per month up to two children hostel allowances is 300 rupees per child up to two children right so hostel allowances same treatment i believe you remember this 300 rupees per month up to two children but only under optional regime not under default regime under default regime it is fully taxable transport allowance i have already discussed if the assessee is not suffering from any disability then fully taxable either optional scheme or default scheme same treatment fully taxable under both the regime but if the employees are uh, suffering with disability like physical disability uh, handicap a uh, blind deaf or dumb in that case up to 3200 per month could be exempt under both the regime same treatment outstation allowances see outstation allowances is given to those employees who works in a transport industry uh, like you can say truck drivers exam truck driver is one example so they are they work in transportation industries and they the nature of work is that they have to spend their time most of the time is spent outside their home outside their city so we give outstation allowances to them we give outstation allowances to them outstation allowance is a personal allowance right is it a traveling allowance no traveling allowance is someone which is given to you i have given you the example that person is generally works in bangalore he generally works in bangalore but sometimes 
his company his organization sends him to other places right the nature of job is such that generally he stays in bangalore but for uh, official purpose sometimes he has to go he has to travel outside the city but outstation allowances is for the employees who works in transportation industries their nature of job is like that they have to be always out of their city right most of the time uh, which uh, will be will be they will be spending out of the city right so we give outstation allowance to compensate that we give outstation allowance to them so outstation allowance is a personal allowance default tax regime fully taxable optional tax regime it could be exempt up to 70% of such outstation allowance or 10000 rupees per month this is 10000 rupees per month whichever is lower in optional tax regime yes one more thing under optional tax regime if an employee is getting both the things he is getting daily allowance also and outstation allowance also in that case daily allowance is an official allowance we will exempt that but in that case if person is getting both the things daily allowances also and outstation also then we will exempt daily allowance and we will make outstation allowance fully taxable i am talking about optional tax regime optional tax regime if person is not getting any daily allowance then 70% of such outstation allowance or 10000 per month whichever is lower we will exempt but in case both outstation allowance as well as daily allowance is provided to the employee in that case daily allowance we will make it fully exempt but outstation allowance would be fully taxable right underground allowance if it is default scheme fully taxable if it is optional scheme it can be exempt up to rupees 100 uh, 800 per month right there are other allowances also like high altitude allowances and all or you don't have to learn that although it is given in your study material but you don't have to learn that because they changes with every altitude with uh, like high hilly area expenses altitude uh, expenses so they change with altitude you don't have to remember also how much amount would be exempt over there that that never comes in examination so uh, you can remember this one up till our under underground allowance that is 800 rupees per month okay other personal allowances see personal allowances are anyways fully taxable under default tax regime except one transport allowances but in optional tax regime we have discussed some personal allowances which could be exempt like hra could be exempt children education allowance could be exempt your um, Hostel allowances could be exempt, outstation allowance can be exempt. But other personal allowances are always fully taxable, like city compensatory allowance, cash allowance, split duty, overtime, medical allowance. This is not medical facility, this is medical allowance. Medical allowance is fully taxable. Servant allowance. Helper allowance was your official allowances. That is for that person was helping in your official duties. Servant allowance is a domestic servant, domestic help. Servant allowance is fully taxable. We will do servant facility also. That is perquisite. This is servant allowance. This is this, what is allowance? Allowance is a part of your salary which you receive in monetary form, right? Lunch allowance is fully. Taxable. This is not lunch perquisite. We will see perquisites in our next lecture when I'll dis I'll be discussing with you th those meal perquisites and all which you get food uh, perquisites. But this is uh, food allowance, lunch allowance, different allowance. Closing allowance, non-practicing allowance, entertainment allowance, these are fully taxable allowances, right? Next is foreign allowances. We have discussed foreign allowances in our uh, last lecture also when I was discussing with you residential status. So what is foreign allowance? If there is an Indian citizen, an Indian citizen who is a government employee and government has um, uh, posted him abroad because like uh, I have given you the example of embassy. Let's say he is working in US in Indian embassy. So whatever the salary which he is receiving, we understand that is deemed to arise in India. Do, do you remember that section 9 that deems to arise in India? So that whatever salary he is getting, whatever allowances he is getting, whatever um, um, perquisites that person he or she is getting, that is deemed to arise in India and also taxable also. But we tax only basic salary. Whatever allowances, foreign allowances, such person who is an Indian citizen who is posted abroad and he receives from Indian government, government of India is paying him any allowances or any perquisite. Foreign allowances and foreign perquisite would be exempt in both the tax regime, right? So please remember this one also. This is quite important. Okay, so this was about allowances.
Next is deductions. Deductions from gross salary. We understand there are three deductions. One is standard deduction. Second is entertainment allowance deduction. Third is tax on employment. We also called it pro uh, professional tax. See, if the assessee is following default tax regime, new tax regime, 115 PSE, then only one deduction is available. That is standard deduction. I'm again repeating. If assessee is following default tax regime, only one deduction is allowed. That is standard deduction. What is, so how much is the standard deduction? Gross salary or rupees 50,000, whichever is lower. And it is same in both the regime. So in standard deduction, you, if you are following optional, then also standard deduction is allowed. Same treatment, gross salary or 50,000, whichever is lower. In uh, default tax regime also, it is allowed. It is allowed, right? Same. Gross salary of 50,000, whichever is lower. But other deductions, that is entertainment allowance deduction and tax on employment, only and only please provide when the SEC is following optional old tax regime, right? So standard deduction is available to both, allowed under both the tax regime. Entertainment allowance deduction, only in optional. Tax on employment, only in optional, right? So how much is the entertainment allowance deduction? First, please remember it is allowed only. First of all, only an optional scheme. Second thing, only and only to central government and state government employee, not even local authority employees, not any other employee. Entertainment allowance deduction would be available to central government and state government employees only. And how much would be the reduction? Least of the following. Actual entertainment allowance received, 20% of basic salary, or I can also say one fifth of basic salary or rupees 5,000. 5,000 per month, 5,000 per month, per annum? No, 5,000 is the flat limit. So, Actual entertainment allowance received 20% of basic salary or one fifth of basic salary or 5000 rupees, whichever is lower, that is the entertainment allowance deduction. Please remember two things it is only under optional scheme and that too only for central government or state government employees only. Okay. Last deduction is section 16.3, that is tax on employment. It is also known as professional tax. So whatever the tax on employment is paid during the year, during the previous year, that is starting from 1st April 23 till 31st March 24. If it, it is allowed only on cash basis, it is allowed only on cash basis. That is whatever is paid during the year, only that is allowed. Either employee has paid it or the employer has also paid it allowed. Please allow it. But it should be, please remember, it should be paid during the previous year. If it is paid after the previous year, it will be allowed in next year because it is allowed only on cash basis, right? Second thing, important thing, if employer has paid this amount to you, if employer has paid this amount to you, again, you can claim deduction, but whatever amount the employer has paid, first make it part of your salary. First make it part of your salary. First, it will become income and then deduction will be provided. Again, repeating. If just employee has paid, if just employee has paid, simply give deduction. If employer has paid, first make it part of your gross salary. It will be part of your gross salary and then give deduction. Deduction will be given. No doubt deduction will be given. But if employer has paid, please make it part of your salary. Right? That is important. But please remember this deduction is available only under optional tax regime. Right? So tell me. Let's say if assessee is following default tax regime, this deduction is not available. Okay. But if employer has paid some amount and the assessee is following default tax regime. So if employer has paid the amount, please make it part of gross salary. One deduction not available. Why? Because deduction is not allowed in default tax regime. Right. Okay. So if any case employer has paid this amount, make it part of gross salary. Next is perquisites. So I think we can stop here. We will stop here in this part and perquisites we will take in next lecture. Right. So till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care. I'll also try to upload question bank also so that you can start practicing questions also. That will comprise of your uh, past year papers. Uh, past year papers, uh, maybe starting from 2020, last four years paper, that is eight attempts paper I'll cover. RTPs and MTPs with solutions for your 2024. Solution would be as per your 2024, right? So let's meet in our next lecture. Till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care.